Have you got your Bibles today? If you have your Bibles, we're going to head back to one of the most powerful portions of Scripture anywhere in the Bible, and that's John 17. The Gospel of John, chapter 17. This is the beginning of Jesus' high priestly prayer. He is our high priest. And he offers what I consider to be the greatest prayer found in all of the scripture. This is the greatest prayer. It is a prayer of consecration. And we will probably do this in three parts because there are three sections to this prayer. John chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Jesus spoke these things, all that he's already said to the disciples up to this point. He spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. There are many great prayers in the Bible, powerful prayers. I would remind you of just a few of those. Solomon in 1 Kings prayed this incredible prayer as the temple was being dedicated to the Lord. Abraham in Genesis 18 prayed an incredible intercessory prayer to the Lord. Uh, Moses, the same thing in Exodus 32, uh, a prayer to save the nation. God was ready to do away with the entire nation that had been led out of Egypt and start over with Moses. Incredible prayers all throughout the scriptures. But the greatest prayer um, I think beyond any shadow of a doubt that's recorded in the Bible is the one that we are studying here today that Jesus offered up to the Lord. In fact, this is really the Lord's Prayer. We often uh, use that smaller prayer that was really the disciples' prayer when they asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray, and he began with our Father who art in heaven. We call that the Lord's Prayer. Really, that's the disciples' prayer. That's the model for us. This is the Lord's Prayer. As he is heading with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, hours away from betrayal and, from dying for, or, and for dying for the sins of the world on the cross, Jesus knows what is coming. He has been speaking last words to his disciples. And now here, he pauses with them as they are on their way to that garden. And he begins to offer this prayer of consecration to the Lord. It's a prayer of preparation because Jesus knows the suffering that is coming. It's a prayer of recommittal to the Lord. To saying to the Father, I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready, Father. Help me to move forward in what you have for me. Let the, let the final act of what I have been sent for, let it be fulfilled and completed. This is an important time. You need to understand as we go forward in John, we'll, there will actually be multiple opportunities for Jesus to veer off course. There will be temptations that will come. There will be chances for Jesus. He is 100% God, but he's 100% human. No human being looks forward to death on a cross. Crucifixion is an incredible, horrible form of death. Jesus knows this is coming, and there will be temptations, just as there was at the beginning of his ministry. I would quickly remind you that as he began his ministry after his baptism, what happened? The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness where he, was, where he fasted for 40 days and nights, and the devil came and tempted him. One of those temptations was, you know what? You don't have to go through all the suffering and the pain. Remember the Gospel of John is a gospel of rejection. How often Jesus has been rejected by his own again and again in this gospel. Satan said, hey, you can go up to the top of the temple 
and you can throw yourself off the temple. Everyone will be there and see this. And the scriptures tell us, the Psalms tell us that the angels will come and bear you up and will not allow you to fall to the ground for your foot to hit a stone. You could do all that and prove to everyone that you're the Messiah. You don't have to go through three years of rejection. You don't have to go through all of the battles. Do it right now and everyone will applaud and you'll be considered the Messiah. Jesus knew this wasn't right. He knew this was a temptation. His brothers tempted him by saying, hey, why don't you go to the feast now and show yourself as the Messiah? We read about that in John as well. Jesus forewent all of those to complete the mission. And the mission is now all but completed. The cross and the resurrection and the ascension are all that is left. Jesus offers this prayer as he heads into this final, these final hours and this final battle as it was. A prayer of consecration. The greatest prayer in all of the scriptures. As Jesus will pray for himself. Then secondly, he will pray for his disciples. We'll cover that next week, Lord willing. And then he will pray for all of us, the church, all the way down through time. In John 17, Jesus prays for these things. But he begins by consecrating himself to the Father one more time, the greatest prayer. With that said, let's us pray right now and ask the Lord to teach us. Heavenly Father, we are so cognizant. We, are, we, we sense and know that you are with us. We thank you for your presence in such a mighty way. We ask right now today that you would grant to us the ability to really see, to know, to understand your word. Eyes to see, ears to hear, as the book of the Revelation says, what your spirit would say to us today. I know you're speaking very, very clearly. Heavenly Father, I know that just as Jesus had opportunities to change the plan or to kind of move off script a little bit, every moment of every day in our life, the enemy throws all kinds of distractions and chances for us to maybe move off of your perfect will for our life. But I pray today that as we study Jesus' call to you, the, consec the consecration, the prayer to you, that we would be reminded to consecrate ourselves afresh and anew as well. To love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. For you have first loved us. Remind us of these truths and encourage us in our Savior's great prayer. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen, amen. and amen. I want to begin very quickly just by mentioning consecration because that's a good Bible word and some of us may be unfamiliar with it. To consecrate something or someone is simply it is is the act whereby a person or a thing is dedicated to the service of the lord that's what consecration is it is an act often usually a prayer whereby we dedicate ourselves or we dedicate some people that you think of hannah in first samuel and she had her son uh, and she dedicated him to the lord there was a Nazarite vow in the Old Testament where uh, families would dedicate children to the Lord. Throughout the scriptures, there are these times of consecration. People like Abraham and, and Isaac, they built altars to the Lord. They did it more than once. Sometimes they would do it multiple times in their lifetime to come back and say, I need to reconsecrate myself, dedicate myself to the Lord afresh and anew. That's what consecration is. This is what Jesus is doing here in John 17. And we're going to cover these first five verses because what we're going to see is that there are certain themes. If you've been with us, there are certain themes that go, that wind their way through the gospel of John. And there are certain themes that Jesus has spoken to his disciples for the last several chapters on. And now it's like the Lord is going to weave these themes into this prayer. This prayer is going to uh, remind us of these themes. They're going to reemerge for us. And so what we'll be doing primarily is picking out these themes and being reminded of them afresh and anew. Or, and there are several this morning that we're going to review and go through. So with that said, we're in John 17 and we get to verse 1. So Jesus is speaking to the disciples and then we're told, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said... 
And I'll just stop right there. Lifting up or raising up his eyes to heaven. What is that symbolic of, or not even symbolic of, but what does that indicate? It indicates that Jesus is now going to be addressing his heavenly father. He's now going to be spoken to the disciples. Now he's going to speak to his heavenly father. We're reminded uh, in John chapter 11, the same terminology is used when Jesus was ready to see Lazarus raised from the dead. The same terminology is used. He lifted up his eyes. He raised up his eyes to the Lord to speak to the Lord. There is no greater ministry that any of us have and no greater privilege that any of us have than the privilege and the ministry of praying to the Lord. And in particular, this prayer of consecration, of rededication to the Lord. So he raised up his eyes, and what did he say in verse 1? He lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, the hour has come. So we're going to stop right here. Does that word, the hour, or that phrase, hour, the hour, does that ring any bells as we've gone through the Gospel of John? It's mentioned again and again, over a dozen times, Jesus talks about the hour is coming. A time, a special time is coming. And so he's mentioned this again and again and again. And he says it here in John chapter 17, as he did the first time, is in John chapter 2 and verse 4, and on and on and on. Let's stop real quick and, and think of this. When we talk about dedicating ourselves, what are we really saying? We're saying, Lord, you've done so much in my life. You have saved me. I am your child, and I'm also here to do whatever you ask me to do. Because you love me, I will serve you. You are the Lord of my life. I will surrender my life to you. You see, the prayer of dedication and the prayer of consecration is one of surrender. And that's been the theme throughout this morning's service. Has been the need to say afresh and anew, more love, more power, more of you in my life. When we consecrate ourselves, it's not that we are saying, now I'm going to go and strive on my own to do these things. But, a, but consecration is a rededication to say, God, I surrender all of that to you so that you can then work in my life and get glory and honor and praise. Because we can't do it on our own. But the Lord wants to work in our lives. And there's an hour in our lives. There are times in our life where God has something special for us. Maybe you can review through your Christian life and there are certain moments. Maybe it was in church. Maybe it's by your bedside. Maybe it's at some other point in time where you say, I know the Lord was leading me up to this point in my life. See, God has a divine timetable for everyone. There was a divine timetable for Jesus. He could not go to the cross too early. He could not fall behind. There was a time. And now Jesus, as he begins this prayer of dedication, he says, the hour's come. We're here. We're at the moment. Not going to put it off. Not going to run from it. Not going to hide from it. I have, my whole life has led me to this moment. Can I state to you that perhaps even today, even right now, some of you, the hour has come. Perhaps it is the hour of, of salvation for you. Perhaps everything has come to this moment where God is saying, this is the time to give your heart to me totally and completely. Perhaps today is the hour. Now is the hour for you to rededicate and reconsecrate yourself to the Lord. Everything has been leading to this moment. You are not here by accident. Oh, no, I just got up and decided to come to church. No, God has a divine timetable. Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. So important that we understand the will and the work of the Father in our lives as Jesus did. And then from there, he moves forward and we get one of these theme words that's also very important. Father, the hour has come. And what does he say? Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. So here we've got this word glorify or glory. This has also been throughout the Gospel of John. We will see it five times in these first five verses. This word will be used and then it will be used another few times, eight times in the entirety of the prayer. This word glory or glorify is used. 
Well, how? How is Jesus going to glorify the Father? How is the Father going to glorify the Son? How is this going to come about? Well, we remember, let's, let's quickly, before we get to, to, to move on from this, let's remember that there have been multiple times in the gospel where Jesus talked about being lifted up. Do you remember that? On three different occasions, Jesus made that statement that the Son of Man will be lifted up in John 3.14, in John 8.28, and again in John 12.32. And he proclaimed this statement. There's, a, there's something going on where the Son of Man will be lifted up, not in the way we think, but he'll be lifted up on the cross. And there's something incredible that's going to happen. Maybe we could call it a reversal, a heavenly reversal that even though the Son of Man will be lifted up on the cross, from that will flow every type of victory and blessing imaginable. From the suffering will come incredible glory and incredible victory. For Jesus and for all of us, when the Son of Man is lifted up, the Lord will be glorified. The world will look at it and say, Ha ha, look what you got. Look what happened to you. Can we please remember, church, as we look through Jesus' life, that what the world considers a defeat, God says, no, this is actually a victory. Amen. Don't ever let the world set the terms on that which is defeat and that which is victory, because in God's economy, things are often the very opposite. That's right. Amen. Amen. The last will be first. You've got to humble yourself in order to be exalted. The one that exalts himself will be humbled. Amen. Amen. The one that is the one that is strong and the one that is merciless. Do they have mercy? No, the opposite. Show mercy and you will receive mercy. The enemy slaps you. Turn your cheek. Let him slap the other cheek. That's fine. Because God wants us to be merciful as Jesus was merciful. There's a reversal here. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, we're talking about glory. He says, Father, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you, verse 2, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that all that you have given him, he will give eternal life to. The glorification, what, what does glory mean? It means to give praise or honor. And so God is going to elevate the horror of the cross, that which seems so horrible, God is going to change that around, and there's going to be glory given to the risen son. Yes, he'll die on the cross, but he'll come out on the other side and there will be glory and honor and praise. And even here, I find it amazing that Jesus' concern is not for himself, but for the glory of the Father. Lord, I want you, Father, I want you to be glorified in this. And we say, well, how did Jesus glorify the Father? And we look back at all the miracles, and there were great miracles, and they absolutely glorified God. In John chapter 2 and verse 11, and John chapter 11 and verse 40, there are all kinds of miracles that Jesus performed that specifically we talk about that this glorified the Father. But might I suggest to you that he brought the greatest glory to the Father through his sufferings and death. Again, from the human point of view, Calvary was just this horrible display of the wickedness of man and the evil of man and the violence of man. Look what man can do. To another human being, a perfect, a sinless, an innocent man. From the human point of view, oh wow, wasn't that terrible? But listen to me, from heaven's point of view, the cross is revealed and magnified the grace and the glory of God. That's what it does. The cross shows us, not that something horrible has happened, but it shows us that God loves us. He does something wonderful and magnificent through the cross. In this way, Jesus is glorifying the Father. He is continuing on with the mission. Time out. Are you continuing on with the mission? You've been saved. God has done something in your life. Is that just being treated as a fire insurance? Put it in my back pocket. Okay, I'm not going to hell now. I've got fire insurance. Now I'll just go on and live my life. Just going to do what I want to do now. Doesn't work that way, does it? We're here to glorify the Father. We're here to do what God asks us to do. Are you continuing in the journey? Do you need today to rededicate, reconsecrate to the purpose that God has called you? There may be some of you here that God wants to do extraordinary beyond what you could ask or think. And he is just waiting 
for us to make sure that we are in that position of surrender to say, yes, Lord, not my will, your will be done. Yes. This is what Jesus is praying when he talks about the glory from God's point of view. He's saying, I'm going to magnify my grace and my mercy through what Jesus is going to do. And so the result of this then, Jesus tells us at the end of verse 2, as he says, as you have given, as you've given authority over, you've given me authority over all flesh, that all whom you have given me, he, meaning the Son, he's speaking now of himself, he may give eternal life. The way that Jesus glorifies the Father, the Father glorifies Jesus through the cross and then through the resurrection and the ascension. The Son glorifies the Father by doing all that the Father asks him and then by giving eternal life. You and I have eternal life because we believe on Jesus Christ. Because we know and understand that we could never make up for our sins. We could, I don't care how good you are. I don't care how many times you think, I just need to do this and this and this, and I'll make up for it. No, you won't. None of us will. We're incapable. See, we don't have the ability to offer anything to God that God could say, okay, yeah, this will make up for what you've done. This is the sad thing about many religions in the world. Did you know that every day in the mind of people of other religions, Islam and in different places, the thought process is always, can I balance the weights today? Can I somehow do enough good things to counteract any of the bad things I've done? Hopefully at the end of the day as I'm going to sleep, I've balanced the weights. Cannot be done. Jesus Christ alone can offer eternal life. And it's only by believing in him. It's not believing in Jesus plus doing all these things. No, it's by believing in Jesus. And then when he comes in, we glorify him as he pours his spirit out into us and he changes us. And we do that which brings glory and honor to him. Amen? It's all about the sequence. It's not about us doing it in our own power. It's about God doing it through his power so that even then we can say, you know what, that boy, that's just not me. But the Lord is doing something. And he always gets the glory and the honor and the praise. And so Jesus says, you've given him authority over all mankind. Can I re quickly remind you that Jesus alone is the judge of all the earth. Every human being will have to stand before him one day. He is the one. It's not anybody else. It's not Judge Wapner or George, Judge Judy or Supreme Court or whoever else. Seriously, it is the Lord. Jesus has authority over all mankind. And he has been given the right because he is God and he has gone through with the mission. He now has the privilege, the authority, the ability to grant eternal life to everyone that believes in him. Hallelujah. You and I are saved today because we have believed in Jesus. And Jesus says, yes, you are one with me and you will have life in me. Eternal life everlasting life we have with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. This thing of eternal life is another important theme in John's gospel. It's mentioned at least 17 times. So Jesus says, I'm going to give them eternal life, verse 3, and this is eternal life. So now we get the definition that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So now we get the definition of eternal life. Eternal life, listen, is not just living forever endless existence. I'm going to shock some of you. And Jesus has already said this earlier in this gospel. Every human being ever born on this earth, ever created, even in the womb, every human being has an eternal soul that will live and exist forever. Every person. Eternal life is not just about living forever. Because that is something that every soul has. They will live forever. Eternal life is about a quality of life. Not a duration, but a quality of life. Where will you spend that endless, that everlasting eternity? Who will you spend it with? Will you spend it with the Lord God Almighty? Jesus himself is eternal life. God's life in us. That is the life we are talking about. Because we will either spend it with the Lord or we will spend it separated from him in hell forever and ever and ever. The lake of fire. So every human being, 
will live forever. When you read eternal life, know that it means more than just everlasting life or existence. It means God's life. It is a quality of life that we have in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says it to us right here in verse 3. This is eternal life. What, that they would live forever? No. That they, because that's going to happen no matter what. That they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life is all about knowing and being in relationship with God. There's nothing greater. I think of all these people that walk around and they have these, I don't know what you would call it, a fandom or whatever about a, another a celebrity, somebody. Oh, if I could meet this person. Oh, if I could get their autograph. Oh, if I could sit down to one meal with them. Oh, how wonderful it would be. One hour with so-and-so, whoever it might be. It means nothing in comparison to the creator of the universe who wants to have a relationship with you and with me forever and ever to know him, this is eternal life. And we know him only in and through Jesus Christ to know the Father and to know the Son. This is eternal life. Listen to me, God is not looking to spend eternity with anyone that just is blasé about it and doesn't take time to say, I want to get to know the Lord. This is why even now on this side of eternity. While we're still on earth, when we're saved, we say, I want to get to know God. I'm going to read his letter to me, his, his love letter, his instruction guide, the scriptures, etern the, the words of eternity. I'm going to read them and get to know him. I'm going to allow his spirit to do a work in me. I'm going to pray and praise and worship together with the family of God. I'm going to get to know God because that, my friends, is eternal life. Amen. Oh, that we would get that that our faith and our devotion to Christ would lead us into this place where we can experience, listen to me, the highest fulfillment in life is only found by knowing Him. I don't care what else you learn about and know about, it means nothing. People devote their whole lives to memorize Shakespeare. Talk about, you know, well, this is how this functions. I can tell you about whatever it is, aerodynamics, or this, it doesn't matter. I can give you all the, the, the sports, the stats of this, this guy, and that um, pfft, it doesn't mean anything. None of that matters. What matters is do we know the Lord? Amen. Do we have fellowship with him? Amen? Do we worship him? Do we praise him? In fact, the New Testament describes eternal life beautifully in two ways. I'm going to get through this very quickly. Number one, eternal life, when we, when we give our hearts to the Lord, when we believe in him, and we are born again, which is what it takes to get to heaven. It's a spiritual renewal. It's something that takes place inside. God puts his spirit within us. We are born again. When that happens, there are two phases to this. Number one, it's a present reality. John 5, 24 says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. Jesus, all the way back in John 5, said, If you believe in me, then you possess, you have eternal life. So eternal life is a present reality. Eternal life is, a, is something that the Lord's followers are given as a gift from him. Romans 6, 23, right? right? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's a gift that's given to us, and we experience the forgiveness of sin, and we know that the guilt is gone, all that great stuff as we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So eternal life is right now. It's active. It's continuous in us as we continue to believe on the Lord. It's a present reality, but this brings me to the second part of eternal life in the Scriptures. It's also a future hope. So John says it like this in his smaller letter towards the end of the Bible in 1 John chapter 5. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of Son of God and the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. As Christians, listen to me, we are not going around and bragging or being presumptuous when we say, I know that I'm saved. That's not being presumptuous. We're not being arrogant when we say that. It's that if you've truly been born again, you know that you have eternal life. It's kind of like, yeah, these are my parents. Yeah, th th this, these are the people that birthed me. 
And I've known them all my life. They're my, that's not arrogant to say, yeah, this is my mom and this is my dad. They really are my parents. Here it is. We know that we have eternal life because we are with the Son and the Son is with us. We have been born again of God's Spirit. When people just walk around like, well, yeah, I've always been a Christian. What do you mean you've just always been a Christian? Now, maybe you were saved when you were very young. That's fine, and, that, and I believe that can happen. But there's an experience of being born again that is a present reality, but it also then becomes a future hope as we continue forward in Jesus Christ. Because eternal life is the opportunity to live forever with God. Amen. And when we enter into this aspect of eternal life, we're passing from death into life. Amen? And guess what? When we're saved, what is saved right now? What, what part of you is saved right now? You say all of you? Well, there's probably one part of you that right now is not fully saved. Do you understand what I'm saying? What's, what's, what part of us is not fully saved right now? I'm not trying to trick you. Our body, right? Yeah, the flesh. So inwardly, this is why the apostle says, hey, look, outwardly our body's decaying day by day, but inwardly we're being renewed. The inner man is being renewed. All right? There's a future reality to salvation. And so I saw someone the other day, and they, they didn't like a particular scripture verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 um, that said, we are being saved. And they thought, oh, I don't like that. I've already been saved. Well, newsflash for you if you read your Bible. The Bible uses at least four different tenses when it talks about salvation. We can say at the same time, we have been saved. There was a time and point in which we were or had been saved, right? We can also, that's number one, past tense. We can also say, I am saved right now. Amen? Can you say that way if you're a Christian? But then guess what? There's another tense that says we are being saved. In other words, we're continuing along in this journey. It doesn't mean that I'm worried about losing my salvation, but it means that God is continuing to work in me. He's sanctifying me. He's doing a work in me. And then there's a fourth tense that the Bible talks about, we shall be saved, as in the future. And that is talking about when our body catches up with our spirit at the resurrection, at the rapture of the church, we're given brand new bodies, and then finally, we are set for eternity. This is wonderful. This is what Jesus means when he says, I've given them eternal life. Those that believe on me, he's praying this prayer of sanctification. It's going to be completed when Jesus returns. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. God is good. How many of you are ready for Jesus to return? Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready for that resurrection body right now. I don't need anything else. I pray for my family and friends that are not saved. I get all that. I get it. I do. But I'm also ready to see the kingdom of God. That's the New Testament saints were in the, completely. They were able to pray for people and they were able to witness. And at the same time, we read all through the New Testament. Maranatha, our Lord, come. We're ready. Amen? We should be excited. We should be ready and anticipating the Lord's soon return. That should be our heartbeat. Yes, Lord. Maranatha, even so, come, Lord Jesus. As I pray for my family members, as I witness to them. But when that day comes, it comes and we say hallelujah. Amen? And so this is what Jesus is saying. He's offered and given eternal life. And then we look at the last two verses, verses 4 and 5, as he's praying this prayer. I glorified you on the earth. Remember, he's praying to the Father having accomplished the work that you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus now returns to this theme of glory one more time. And he rejoices that he can bring glory to the Father. How? How does Jesus say, I can bring glory to you? What does he say there? I glorified you on the earth. How? How? having accomplished the work that you've given me to do. I've, I, I can glorify God. You and I can glorify God as we accomplish his purpose and his will for our lives. We bring glory and honor to him. Jesus said, I've accomplished the work. Isn't it amazing? He's yet to go to the cross, and yet he can say it's like it's already done. So he's done the work and yet he'll still go to the cross. But what he's saying at this point is, I've gone through all the hurdles thus far. We're, we're ready. I've glorified you. I've accomplished. In other words, Jesus is saying in this consecration prayer, 
I'm ready to go. We're, it's, it's done. It's a done deal. Even though there will still be opportunities to veer off to the right or the left, and thus he is praying, but he says, Lord, I am glorifying you. Incredible. Because, of the fin because I finished the work that you've given me to do. Every moment of Jesus' life, from his birth, the incarnation, to his death and resurrection is a moment of glory. If we remember all the way back in John 1.14, Jesus said, uh, or, or we were told by John that we have seen his glory. And in chapter 2 and verse 11, the signs through which he revealed his glory to us. You see, Jesus' work, it's not just referring to his miraculous works, but to all of God's work that he had been sent to accomplish. And so he says in chapter 5 and verse 17, My father is always at his work up to this very day, and I too am working. The father's working, and I'm working. And so one last quick time out here. Are we finishing the work that God has called us to do? Listen, let's not peter out at the end. Well, I'm retired. Well, you may be retired from a job, but we're not retired from serving Jesus. God still has a plan for you. God still has a purpose for each and every one. That's why we're still here breathing. God still has something for us to do. So I ask you again, are we finishing the work that God has for us, and are we doing it with a burst to the finish line? He's got a calling for you. He wants us to do work for him. I'm going to tell you something. With God's help, I'm going to reconsecrate myself afresh and anew today to say, God, I'm going to finish the work that you have called me to do. Are you with me on that? That's so important that we get that. And just one more verse. In verse 5, Jesus moves from his earthly glory to his pre-incarnate glory. What do we mean by that? Well, Jesus is God. He's always existed. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus is God, and when he came to this earth and took on human flesh, we often talk about that being the Son. And people can talk about, well, should we call him the Word before the Incarnation and then the Son? I don't really care, but we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have the Trinity in the Scriptures. And Jesus is now referencing, he's saying, Father, I'm getting ready to complete this task, and then I'm coming back to you to share in the glory that we have had from the beginning, before time began. Jesus is heading back to heaven. Now, this, this to me is, is pretty powerful, because what it means is that when Jesus came to this earth, in one sense, he surrendered that glory. He surrendered a portion of it because as God, he was confined to one human body to be in one place at one time. And so... In the book of Philippians, Paul says it like this. Who, as he already existed in the form of God, meaning Jesus, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. In other words, Jesus, had Jesus been up in heaven and said, you know what, I don't want to do this. I'm God. I don't want to confine myself to an earthly body and go through all of this. I'm God. I shouldn't have to do this. He didn't consider that something to hold on to. He said, you know what? I will willingly surrender this and go and do the work that needs to be done. And I will take on the form of a servant. And that's what Philippians 7 says. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of man. And here Jesus is saying, I'm ready to come back and to share in the glory that we had before any of this started, before the worlds began, because Jesus himself is God. Again, don't misunderstand me. He possessed glory during his earthly life, the glory of the incarnate Son, given by the Father, uh, recognized by his followers. Again, John 1:14. let me read it to you one more time. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So all this was happening. But can I tell you something? After Jesus is raised from the dead, after he's ascended, after he is exalted and has a name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven, on earth, beneath the earth. At that point in time, the glory is full and complete. The complete glory of the Godhead beyond our human experience, resulting again in his supremacy over everything in creation. I love the song that Keith Green wrote so long ago, and he says he wrote it when he was in an airport, and he saw some of these uh, cult people that would go around and hand out tracts, 
And they were coming to him, Moonies and different ones, and, and he just started singing this little song. It came into his heart. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus, he is Lord of all. No sin is too big, no problem too small. Jesus is Lord of all. And that is who Jesus is. And this is what he is referring to, his exaltation. Back to heaven to be with the Father and the Spirit will be sent. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus says, the glory that I had with you before the world was. I'm going to finish by just reminding you that what we have here in this prayer is that it lays out for us and reminds us that just ahead, Jesus is going to have to deal with tremendous pressure from the enemy and from the world and probably, in a sense, his own flesh. All right? So he consecrates himself afresh to the Father. Jesus doesn't pray because he's going to become the victim. He's the victor. But he prays here and re-consecrates himself because he understands that there will be suffering involved. And he understands that even maybe his own flesh may say, oh, no, we don't want to go through this. So he pauses here as he's speaking these last words to the disciples and he re-consecrates himself to the heavenly Father. So this is an appropriate prayer. It's a dedication prayer. It's much needed. And to me, this prayer should encourage you and I to consecrate ourselves afresh and anew as we frankly approach the end of this age. We're coming down to the end of all things. This is the time for you and I, afresh and anew, to say, Lord, we're going to finish strong. We're running the race and we see the finish line Right up, we see the tape right in front of us. We're going to push strong with you by your strength and your help. We're going to reconsecrate ourselves to you. We're not going to be distracted. We're not going to get turned to the right or the left. We're going to finish strong. That's what Jesus is praying right here. Lord, I'm finishing the work that you've called me to do. I'm going to ask Brother Ivor if he would come. And as he does, I just want to share with you, and maybe just if you would bow your heads, but I want to share with you for a moment. Just bow your heads and close your eyes because I want to speak to each and every one of you. Just very honestly. Folk, it's too late in the game to not be in the game. To be sitting on the sidelines. God has not called us to be spectators. We cannot afford to be distracted by temporary things. How horrible will it, would it be to not win the, the race because there's something on the ground or you hear someone else's voice and you turn to look and then you don't finish the race strong. There's so many temporary things that are vying for our affections as believers that can become distractions. And we've got to be so careful with those things. I'm going to make a strong statement. You can agree or disagree, but this is in accordance with the scripture. Jesus said if anyone loves, even family members, father, mother, brother, sister, son, if anyone loves someone else more than me, the love of the father is not in them. It cannot be that way. So can I tell you something? You cannot love anything or anyone more than Jesus. And we all, we all say amen to that. But folks, sometimes it, it can become a cliche where we say it. But I have seen people fall away from the Lord because they've loved blood family more than anything else. Well, you know, my family's just not coming and I can't miss being with them. So I've seen people miss out with God. Because the love for their blood family becomes greater than their love for Jesus Christ. Some love pleasures more than Jesus. Well, I have to do this, and I have to do that, or I want to do this, and I want to do that. Some people love knowledge about Jesus more than they love Jesus himself. There's some people that are, are so dedicated to knowing all of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, but can I just remind you of something? It's not just knowing about it in your head. It's about knowing God and living it out in your life. See, there's a lot of people that know, all, and this was what concerns me in America. We have Bibles everywhere. We have people that just reflexively say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, how are you a Christian? Well, I was born in America. I'm a Christian. Of course I am. We have all this mindset there's a lot of, of Christianity within just the culture at large. And so people just think, well, yeah, I know about God. I know Jesus died on the cross, so I'm a Christian.
But can I tell you something? If we're not living it out, if, if, if the life of Christ within is not real, what about the fruit of the Spirit? I've been thinking about these things so much, folk. And some of us, we, we, we may know the words, but what about is there lack of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's not enough to just say it or to know about the Bible. We actually have to have surrendered to Him. My heartbeat is that you and I would reconsecrate ourselves to the Lord as Jesus did right here in John 17, that we would reconsecrate, rededicate ourselves to the Lord for the final journey because it's coming to an end quickly. It's coming to an end very quickly. And the only thing that's going to matter is our relationship with Jesus. When everything else is said and done, that's the only thing that's going to carry on into eternity. Heavenly Father, I just pray right now, would you minister to each and every one of us that are here? Father, I would ask that this would be a time of rededication and reconsecration as Jesus consecrated himself afresh and anew to you, Father. I pray we as your people would do the same even now today because we are coming up to the end of all things. Remind us of these truths so that we might glorify and honor you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Now I'm just simply going to say this to you. If you want to reconsecrate yourself to the Lord, I'm doing it. I'm going to ask you if you're able to come forward, to come up forward. I think a, there's something special about when we can come forward and rededicate ourselves to the Lord. God is calling some of you. He's wanting to do a work in your life and in your heart. If you sense the Lord calling you to rededicate, I'm going to ask you to come forward if you can. If you're physically unable, then in a moment I'll ask you to raise your hand. But if you're physically able and you sense the Lord wants you to do it, we're going to spread all the way out across the front here to rededicate ourselves to the Lord. It's time, folks. There's, there's no time left. I'm, there's a sense of urgency. God has given me this today. I know it. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know we need to dedicate ourselves afresh and anew to Him, consecrate ourselves to Him.